Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming today afternoon. Today I'll speak on the Bhagavad Gita 8.15. The topic will be the problem of pain. The problem of pain. Why does pain exist in this world? So the Bhagavad Gita 8.15 is Mamupetya Punar Janma Dukkhale Mashashvatam Napnuvanti Mahatmanaha Samsiddhim Paramam Gataha. Krishna says, those who devote themselves to me, they attain my eternal abode and do not come to this world which is distressful and temporary. So now I'll talk this in three broad parts. First is we look for a material explanation, materialistic explanations for why pain exists. Then we we'll look for philosophical or spiritual explanations. And then we we'll look for a look about practical ways of addressing or dealing with pain. So let's begin first with the materialistic level of reality, which is where most people are at. And if we consider it a mater nobody likes pain. And generally anybody and everybody would like to avoid pain as much as possible. But still pain keeps coming upon us. Now why does pain come like this? If we look at uh, a functional, see there is, there, is, there is functional materialism and then there is philosophical materialism. Functional materialism means where people just seek material pleasures in life and that they don't think much about philosophy. But philosophical materialism is where people think that matter is all that exists. So functionally on a day-to-day -day basis we always try to avoid pain and gain some pleasure. And generally when the people are asked oh, why are there so many problems in life, people just say that's the way it is. There's life, there are problems and then there are pleasures and the problems will make your pleasures sweeter. The world is a place of duality, kabhi khoshi, kabhi gum, as they say. So this is the nature of the world. Now we might say that yes, pleasure, pain makes pleasure sweeter and it, it can be true at a functional level. But does that make pain a virtue or a necessity? It's a, it's a rationalization by which we, we somehow reconcile with the existence of pain. If, if pain were necessary to make pleasure sweeter, how many people voluntarily go and embrace pain? Isn't it? Oh, you know, till now, everywhere that I invested my money, you know, it just kept growing, kept growing. So now, I will deliberately invest my money in a place where it will all crash. And when I lose my money like that, after that when I gain money, it will be sweeter. I have been healthy for so long, you know, actually health has become boring. So, I will jump under a train and fracture myself. And then after that when I become healthy, I will feel better. So, nobody does that. So, so oh, this idea that, okay, pain makes pleasure sweeter, that might be functionally true, but that is a way we are reconciling our, resigning ourselves to the existence of pain. We are not actually uh, necessarily pointing out to pain as a virtue. Mm -hmm. So why does pain exist at all? That question uh, remains unanswered. Now if we go at a level of at a functional materialism, we don't get an answer. Okay, that's how it is. People just say it's your bad luck that you, that you are having this problem and can't do much about it. So now if we go at a level of philosophical materialism, actually it's where matter is all that exists. It's, it's, a, it's a serious problem because one major purpose of medical science is to free people from pain. Of course the positive purpose is to give people health. But at, at a basic level also to remove people from pain. In fact, People don't come to doctors primarily to become healthy. It is only when they are unhealthy, and not just when they are unhealthy, it is when they are unhealthy and they feel pain. That is when they go to a doctor. So, 
the doctor's purpose may be to improve health but the patient's purpose in the going to the doctor is to become free from pain so a major purpose of medical science is to free people from pain and yet all of medical science has no meter no device by which we can measure pain you know we have a thermometer we have barometer we don't have a painometer so does pain even have if you look at the materialistic world view uh, what is pain now does pain even have a existence within the within the philosophical materialist world world view there is yes you could say the if the hand is fractured the hand is misaligned this way or the acid content in the body uh, in the stomach is high or this particular metric is wrong the way it should be it is not like that but pain as a conscious experience doesn't even have existence within the materialistic world view in fact obviously pain is something we all experience and we may philosophically analyze and rationalize in various ways but pain is where life's reality comes out in a very grave way for us in an undeniable way so therefore what is important is that sham sundar bhagwan ki so oh, so now some people say from the uh, sci- sci- atheistic perspective whether where evolution is not just seen as a theory but it is seen as a ideology that explains everything they say actually pain simply exists because pain through pain unwanted bodily features unwanted bodily disorders and unwa- living beings with unwanted things are eliminated so pain is a evolutionary eliminator that's what they say that through that say if a deer can't run fast enough it tries to run fast it feels pain but it can't run onwards eventually it is caught and is killed so pain indicates uh, an evolutionary dysfunctionality and that's how it it eliminates so it's a evolutionary virtue they say why are the nature of the world is that it's survival of the fittest and one organism lives on another and that's why pain is just a, a, a part of the existence in this world but still that doesn't explain we say okay that is that is the way the world is but see there is a observation and there is a explanation so the observation even if you give a name to it okay it is because survival of the fittest is there that's why there is so much struggle and that's why there is pain okay but that's not a explanation okay why is the world fashioned in such a way that there is so much struggle so at the material level although everybody is trying to remove pain there is no real explanation for pain but often atheistic people use the presence of pain as a very strong argument to say that there cannot be any good god that there is so much suffering in this world then how could there be any good god that and it's not just suffering it's indiscriminate suffering it's not just bad people suffer even good people suffer so when good bad things happen to good people when they go through unbearable pain people say this proves that there is no god at all but we could turn this question around and within a strictly materialistic world view we could ask okay you're saying that bad things happen to good people and therefore god doesn't exist okay but before that let's ask a fundamental question why should bad things not happen to bad, good people so what do you mean you know, good things should happen to good people bad things to bad people what why if everything that exists is running simply based on unguided natural forces then there should be no correlation between action and reaction anything should happen to anyone so the very fact that we expect good things to happen to good people and bad things to happen to bad people the very fact that we expect a cause effect correlation 
why should that cause effect correlation be present at all why within the materialistic worldview everything is happening by unguided natural forces so good things happening to bad people say there is a herd of deer which is running and a li and a lion chases the deer and the lion pounces on one deer and not another deer now why this deer and why not that deer I'll say, okay, maybe the lion, lion thought that I could catch this deer better, faster. Okay, but why? They say, it's just chance. Now, if it is all chance, then why point out the lack of cause-effect correlation? Isn't it? If everything is by chance, then why say that, okay, why are good things, bad things happening to good people? And functionally, nobody lives by this chance doctrine. Now, how... Is there any parent who will grow up that raise their children telling, no, in this world everything runs by chance. Whether you study or don't study, what is going to happen to you is by chance. You know, whether you clean your room or don't clean your room, you know, your, whether, how your room will be by chance. Whether you brush your teeth or don't brush your teeth, whether your teeth stay good or not, it is all by chance. Even atheists don't train their children like that. Isn't it? So at least at a functional level, we train our children, you know, you, you behave like this, you'll stay healthy. You eat healthy food, you'll stay healthy. You eat unhealthy food, you'll become sick. You eat too, too many chocolates, just uh, your uh, teeth will get spoiled. So the fact is that we do see a cause-effect correlation to some extent. And there are some times when the cause-effect correlation is not seen. So, because we see the cause of a correlation for most of the time and because we expect it to be there all the time, that when it is not there, we ask the question, why is it not there? Why is it not? The question, why are bad things happening to people, that presumes that, okay, normally good things should happen to good people. So, if we have a big notice board and on that notice board, there are many notices and one notice says, everything on this notice board is, every notice on this notice board is false. Is there a problem with that? If you have one, there are many notices and one notice is, every notice on this notice board is false. What is the problem with that? This statement itself is false. Yeah, then what about this statement could also be false, isn't it? <laughs> if every notice is false, then even this notice is also a notice. So is this notice also false then? It is a self-contradictory statement. Mm -hmm. So the, in logic, self-contradictory statements collapse into themselves. If somebody says, I can't speak a single word of English. Well, you already spoke seven words. Isn't it? <laughs> so, when we, when we point out, oh, why are bad things happening to good people? Therefore, there is no God. No, if you are saying there is no God, because bad things are happening to bad, good people, that means you are actually asking, you are presuming that there is a cause-effect correlation, and then you are asking, why is the exception there? But we turn the question around and ask, what is the basis of the presumption? So, within the worldview of atheism, everything becomes relativistic. If everything is by chance, then there is no reason for this pointing out why are, why are, why are bad things happening to good people. Often atheists point out how certain religious practices are illogical. Oh, you worship a stone, you do this ritual, you do this, you do that. It's also illogical. But actually, if it, it, they say this has no meaning. But within the atheistic worldview, nothing has any meaning. Because life itself is meaningless. Life itself is, we somehow are like parcels of protoplasm who somehow came alive for some time. We flap around for some time and then we die. So, atheism, materialism, what it does is, it inundates us within an ocean of meaninglessness. Then to point out, oh, why is this meaningless? Why is this meaningless? Well, the whole worldview is meaningless. So basically, I won't go into a refutation of atheism over here. The point here is that the problem of pain at a material level has no answer. Now, there are, 
there is the within the religious explanations there are broadly two different kinds of religions you could say there's the abrahamic religions which is judaism christianity islam and then there are the dharmic religions dharmic religions are hinduism buddhism jainism sikhism so these have certain fundamental differences now the abrahamic religions hold that actually there was original sin because of which everybody is suffering so adam and eve sinned against god by eating the forbidden apple and because of that sin has transmitted down to everyone like a genetic defect and because of that sin all sufferings come up now this is one explanation but then there are several issues with it you see the pain is because of that but now that the problem which we have with pain is not just the presence of pain it is the difference in pain you know what is our problem primarily is not just the presence of pain but the difference in pain that okay if everybody were poor okay we would just resign ourselves to it but some people are poor and some people are wealthy if everybody were mediocre looking okay but some people have outstanding looks and some people have outstandingly poor looks so it is not just the presence of pain it is the difference in pain and the idea that there is some original sin because of which all of us are contaminated and because of which all of us are suffering that doesn't explain the difference in pain that doesn't explain why pay different people go through different pains at different times also another problem is that there are, in the abrahamic religion the idea is that only humans have souls humans will be elevated and liberated so if pain is a reaction to sin and the solution to that sin is to be saved by jesus that can be done only by human beings so there for a long time there are many christian philosophers and scientists who resisted the idea that animals have consciousness because if animals have consciousness then animals have pain and why should animals have pain that they don't have souls and they cannot have committed the original sin and now animals also go through a lot of pain it's not just when they are sick and they have diseases but sometimes in animals in the wilderness animals get wounded now we sometimes live in cities and we may idealize the Uh, the forest and the jungles oh such a peaceful place yes there is serenity at one level but in the jungle there is also brutality there is a very deadly struggle for existence so why is pain present among animals also so within that world view that there is a original sin because of which everyone is suffering this difference in pain and the prevalence of pain in the animal world is not explained because ultimately again uh animals do have consciousness sometimes people say okay you know actually vegetarian people you eat uh, you eat vegetables and meat eaters eat meat but you cut uh, cut vegetables you kill vegetables we kill animals what is the difference so there's a big difference in terms of the magnitude of pain that is suffered animals have much more developed nervous systems and that's why they suffer far more pain a simple thought exercise we could say say if tomorrow your child comes and says you know our teacher has said that we are going uh, for a field expedition to a farm where we will be seeing harvesting mm-hmm. now would you, you let your let your child go there certainly yeah it's education you can see harvesting whenever harvesting happens the crops are blooming and people come and cut it's a mood of celebration but tomorrow if a child came and said you know Uh, we are having a field expedition to a slaughter house to see how animals are killed which parent would allow children to go so we intuitively know there is a difference between say cutting crops and cutting animals and a big difference so there is pain in the animal world also and why this pain is present is very difficult to understand within either the materialistic world view or the religious world view which says all pain comes from original sin now going further if we look at the dharmic traditions 
the dharmic traditions if you consider primarily the bhagavad gita as a central book in dharmic traditions the bhagavad gita explains that the question of pain is actually very difficult to answer but there can be multiple levels of explanations now some people take the dharmic explanation in a over simplified way and they say all your problems are because of your past karma now this is this has to be carefully understood it 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 is not a simplistic explanation uh if somebody say on a cold night they eat a dozen ice creams and then they wake up in the next morning previously they were eating ice creams and in the next morning they say ice cream <laughs> they start screaming in pain now if their throat is terrible now is that because of past karma okay past karma past nights karma <laughs> not some past lives karma so basically <laughs> the, the idea that suffering is because of past karma that has to be understood a little carefully so the principle here is that there is a cause effect connection and when there is a cause effect connection we all need to move forward in life understanding why things are happening the way they are happening so as i said earlier we all operate based on our understanding of cause effect and generally in our day to day life also we try to look at bigger and bigger pictures to understand things if the smaller picture doesn't make sense so right now we are sitting and suddenly the light goes off then you will immediately look and say okay uh, has that has that light stopped working you could look at one explain okay you could first, first look at has somebody accidentally switched off that turned off the switch so that is one cause of why the light go off because somebody accidentally turned off the switch another explanation could be okay the switch is on then uh, so that is one immediate small cause of a connection the other loop you could put it in is okay maybe that bulb got spoiled maybe the bulb and its time duration expired okay that could be another explanation another loop in which you could put that another loop you could put it is okay maybe the electric power supply has gone cut 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 off because of which we are not having power now you could say okay the electric supply has got to cut off is it that somebody stepped on the wiring on the way to my home it's only my house or is it in the whole locality or it could be that there is a power plant and the power plant there's a terrorist who attacked and exploded the power plant and because of that the whole area is submerged so now normally whenever we look for an explanation of something going wrong we look at the most immediate explanation or the most apparent explanation most obvious explanation and when that explanation doesn't make sense then we like try to put it in a bigger context bigger context and a bigger context and a bigger context and generally we try to make sense of things by placing them in the appropriate context so now as i said these are not contradictory it could be because of the switch going off it could be because of bulb going off it could be because of power going off it could be because of the power plant power plant going off uh, anything any of these could be possible so similarly when we face any issue in our life so the first level of explanation is just look at causes in this world if somebody is somebody is got a poor throat or got their throat has become sore that's did you eat anything inappropriate and you find explanation that level that is good enough mm-hmm. and no need to move forward behind that and when a problem can be fixed with explanation at that level it should be fixed at that level say if a if a thief ro- robs a citizen and a citizen goes to the king i have been robbed and the king says oh you are robbed by your past karma <laughs> that's ridiculous you what is actually i was robbed by the thief and the king is responsible to rectify it so so if if there is a pain which is at a immediate level we need to rectify it at a immediate level and work work has to be done to rectify it at a immediate level but sometimes we, there is no explanation for it at a immediate level or 
there is no solution for it at an immediate level. That means, say, if in a house there are four people staying and one person gets malaria. Now you could say more or less all of them are eating the same food, all of them go to the same gym, all of them have reasonably similar health. Uh, you, you may say, okay, why did they get malaria? Because a mosquito bit them. But then you will say, why did, the, why did the mosquito bite only this person, not other three people? Well, maybe the mosquito say that the mosquito bit all the four people, but this person got had low immunity. But then, why? If all of them were having similar health, similar exercise, why low immunity? Sometimes the obvious explanations may not make sense. Then we have to understand that, okay, this person got malaria. Maybe it is because of some past karma. That because of past karma, they had to go through some phase of bad health. So, why this particular person, why not some other person? So, when the immediate explanation doesn't make sense, then we expand the con con context to a bigger frame. And this is where the Bhagavad Gita's understanding of the soul and its reincarnation comes into the picture. That the frame of reference is not just to this life, but it is beyond this life to previous lives and future lives also. So just like if somebody has a credit with a, with a supermarket chain and then they say whatever I will purchase from you on credit at the end of the month I will pay you. Now somebody goes to that credit, uh, goes to the supermarket and buys something worth two dollars. They buy some and then they get a bill worth five hundred dollars. What? I buy, I bought two dollars, why five hundred dollars? Because what they are being charged for is not just based on what they paid immediately, what they are bought immediately. It is a bigger frame, it is a one month frame. So similarly, the one explanation from the dharmic perspective is that when we get, we get sufferings, it is, it could be because of our recent actions or it could be because of our remote actions. So if we can explain things at the level of recent actions, then we need to explain and we need to address them at that level. If things can't be explained at the level of recent actions, then we move back to remote level. And understand that this is because of some remote action that it has happened like this. Now, now this is a, a explanation that can, I said earlier, why, are, why the difference in pain? The idea that because of our original sin we are suffering, original sin we are suffering, that can't explain the difference in pain. But you understand the difference in pain is because of difference in karma from the past. And the suffering in the animal world is also because of the animals are also souls. They have also lived in the past as human beings and they have also done some karma. And by that karma, they may sometimes suffer. Last year when I had gone, come to America, Australia, I had gone to a walk. So I, near a, I saw near a park, some website. I think it was in Australia only, you know, maybe in America. It was called registeryourdog.com. So it says, in case your dog is lost, then you register it here. We'll, it'll, there'll be some kind of name, label, number put in its code and you can found and got it. I was thinking, in India, even human beings are not registered. <laughs> <laughs> what to speak of registering dogs? So you could say, that a dog in Australia lives far more comfortably than a dog in India, a street dog in India especially. Now why the difference? Again, it's a big difference. So the difference is again karma. So the problem of pain can be much more reasonably explained by considering the bigger circle of karma. Now still, there is no exhaustive explanation. Why? Because we don't know what karma because of which we are suffering when. And that's why there is a certain amount of a certain amount of humility needed whenever we ascribe any suffering to any particular cause. Generally, I have never seen anywhere in scripture if somebody is suffering, other people tell them. That you are suffering because of your past karma. That is just never done. When, uh, when for example, Draupadi is being dishonored, or Draupadi is dishonored by Dushasana and Duryodhana and others, nobody tells Draupadi, 
and actually you know you must have been somebody like dushasan in your previous life you must have dishonored a woman and that's why you are being dishonored now no we see from this life's perspective it is a terrible thing and it needs to be stopped so this brings me to the so the first point i spoke was within a materialistic world view how there is not a very reasonable explanation for karma then i talked about in the within the theistic world views the idea of one lifetime with one original sin doesn't explain things as reasonably as a multi life cause effect connection as explained to karma now for us most that, now this being the third point the last point of the class is most important thing is that how do we deal with it why something is happening is important to know to the extent that we can deal with it so for example if we consider mosquitoes if we consider malaria then we understand okay mos if, if mosquitoes are biting then we should try to protect our environment so that there are no mosquitoes and then the incidence of malaria will go down but there are some diseases like many forms of cancer for which the specific cause is not known Now, now there is a difference between cause and mechanism. We know the mechanism by which cancer occurs in the body, or cancer spreads in the body. Although we do not know the specific cause, why cancer comes to one person, not to another person. So then, what do we do in the medical field? Even though we do not know the precise cause of cancer, and everybody has their favorite, I use the word, ideological hobby horse. ideological hobby horse means every people will say oh cancer it is because of sedentary lifestyle oh, oh cancer it is because our food is so contaminated now with chemicals oh cancer oh it is because our air is so contaminated cancer oh it is because you are talking so much on phone so the vibrations from the phone are coming now all of these could contribute partially or maybe none of them we don't know so sometimes when somebody has a they their pay like some people like to ride a horse they have their pet horse which they like to ride so similarly different people have their own pet ideological horse so whenever any problem they just ride on that horse just see this is because of this this is because of this this is because of this now the scriptures resist such simple explanations in the bhagavatam there is a very uh, very revealing or perplexing incident depending on how you look at it and parikshit maharaj in the first canto is traveling around in his kingdom because he has heard that the dark age of kali is spreading its influence and he goes around and he sees most people are engaged in devotional activities they are glorifying krishna and krishna's devotees and he's very happy but then he comes to a particular place where a cow and a bull are being ruthlessly beaten by a person dressed in black who looks like a king and parishit maharaj immediately takes out his sword and he just ties that person that person shrinks back in fear and then he turns towards that cow and bull and he asks them what is the cause of your suffering now he said this is a ridiculous question can you see this this man was beating me that's why i'm suffering so his question might seem insensitive at best or insensible at worst but You see, he asks this question still, and he's an intelligent person. And the bull answers the question. The bull says, "Actually, different philosophers say there's a different cause of suffering. Some people say it is past karma. Some people say it is just material nature. Some people say it is kala. Some people say it is just all suffering is in the mind. Some people say that suffering is the will of God." hearing all these different philosophers we are confused about the cause of suffering and then we say why don't you tell he is beating you so his answer might seem also perplexing but after that parishit maharaj responds is even more amazing he says bravo he says you by your answer have shown that you are really wise why are you wise he says that you are not blaming anyone for your suffering so the point over here is it's a very instructive point that when we face suffering we certainly want to find a cause for the suffering now as far as the bull and the cow are concerned parikshit is already going to address that cause he is already pushed the attacker behind and is going to punish the attacker that immediate cause is addressed 
But he, the whole mood of the Bhagavatam is to go beyond immediate causes, to look for deeper causes, to look for deeper explanations. And therefore, when the bull does not obsess over the immediate explanation, then that's where there is wisdom. That's where there is wisdom. And that wisdom is what Parikshit Maharaj appreciates. So for us today, at a, when we face pain, it could be different kinds of pains, whatever it is. But when we face pain, at an immediate level, we need to work for it. Say, if we are sickly, maybe we can make an, do, eat, eat healthy food, do some exercises, take some proper medicines to become healthier. If you have financial insecurity, you can work to get a better job, get better training, get planning, better financial advice and planning so that we can get more financial security. At an immediate level, we need to work. But we don't have to limit ourselves to the immediate level. Because at an immediate level, one pain will go, but another will come. The nature of the world is, it's like waves coming. We resist one or we deal with one wave, the next wave will come soon. So we deal with it at the immediate level, but we don't restrict our endeavors to at the immediate level alone. And this is where bhakti wisdom comes in. That what the Bhagavad Gita explains is that at a fundamental level, the problem of pain points to incompatibility. This is like the biggest framework as you put it. What incompatibility? That we long for happiness and the world gives us pain in so many different ways. Why is that? If you look at our own body, the body itself, the ways in which the body can give pleasure are limited. The, each of the senses, you can say they give us some pleasure. Say all the, maybe you touch something soft, you get some pleasure. You see something beautiful, you get some pleasure. So we could say all the senses can give us pleasure. But what about the internal organs? Is there any way your liver or kidney can give you pleasure? There's no way. But can the liver and kidney give us pain? In many ways. So overall, if you look at this, we all want happiness and we are in a situation, we are in a body and in a world where the ways in which we can get pain is far greater than the ways in which we can get pleasure. So why is the situation like this? It's because of a fundamental incompatibility. The Bhagavad Gita explains that we are spiritual beings. We belong to a spiritual level of reality. Currently, we are at the material level. And in the material level, pain is inevitable. So the ultimate solution to pain is to raise our consciousness from the material level to the spiritual level. So when we practice Bhakti Yoga, when we chant Hare Krishna, when we come to the temple, when we worship the deities, when we associate with devotees, by all this, we are raising our consciousness to the spiritual level. And while dealing with the pain, with pain at the immediate level, we don't reduce our efforts to dealing with pain only at that level. We spend some time, necessary time to deal with it at that level. But along with that, we invest significant amount of time to raise our consciousness to the spiritual level. And by that, we will be able to address pain at the ultimate level. And the material and the spiritual don't have to be seen as contradictory. The material and the spiritual are both complementary. Both are complementary. I'll conclude with one example over here. Let's say when a patient is sick and is in pain. At that time, the doctor will give some, say, antiseptic if there's an infection to remove the cause of the infection. But if the, to, but if the patient is, to remove the cause of the sickness, but if the patient is in pain, the patient will also give, the doctor will also give an analgesic, something to deal with the pain. Now, balanced treatment will have both the antiseptic and the analgesic. Now, from the doctor's perspective, which is more important? Antiseptic. antiseptic because that is what is going to cure the patient. Now, from the patient's perspective, which will seem more important? Analgesic. The analgesic, isn't it? Oh, you know, I take this medicine, it's so expensive, I take it and nothing happens. This medicine is so cheap, I take it and pain goes away. So, now, so that's why the doctor's perspective and the patient's, doctor's purpose and the patient's purpose are the same. That doctor and patient's purpose are the same, but doctor's and patient's perspective may be different. 
for the pers from the doctor's perspective antiseptic is more important from the patient's perspective analgesic is more important so similarly for us we have material needs and we have spiritual needs so our material needs are like analgesics so we need food we need clothing we need shelter we need financial security we need health uh, we need a social position all these are required now if we don't get them it causes a lot of pain just like if there's no painkiller there is pain yeah. but if we get them there is no freedom from pain there's only the relief from that pain for a short while it is some people say you know what is the use of all discussing all this philosophy there are so many hungry people just go and feed them yes it's definitely important to feed hungry people and we also do it millions of people are fed by hungry people also by the krishna consciousness movement uh, but important thing is okay hunger is a problem hmm? but is hungry people are in distress but are all the well fed people happy no so it's it's important no doubt the material needs are important food is vital but ultimately it's like a pain killer so we need it but we have, we can't be consumed only by that we can't think that just taking the painkiller will be enough we need the painkiller and we need the medicine the antiseptic is krishna consciousness is bhakti yoga by which we raise our consciousness when we raise our consciousness spiritually then we are not only addressing the problem at the ultimate level but sometimes there are some material problems for which no painkiller works generally when there is a disease pain medicine may be given but sometimes the disease may be so bad that no matter how much pain you pain medicine you it doesn't work still pain will be there so similarly for us when there the, we all will face problems in life and there is no pain medication to deal with the problems say there's uncertainty will i lose my job there's uncertainty no my child is not behaving properly there's uncertain there's anxiety there is worry now for these there is no painkiller there is no way to deal with it for this what do we need we just need maturity so krishna i was saying that krishna kaunch bhakti yoga is like the antiseptic but bhakti yoga can also act as an analgesic at times how is analgesic suppose say we have a problem normally we we think that i have to deal with this problem many of us may feel that oh yeah i want to practice bhakti but i don't have time for it there are so many things to do in life yes it's true we all have a lot of things to do but our time is not just taken by our activities our time is also taken by our thoughts and sometimes our thoughts don't lead to any productive activity there is activity there is thought and there is time we usually think of our schedule in terms of activities i have to do this activity this activity this activity and my day is full but our time is taken not just by the activities but by thoughts now we say thoughts and activities are related if i have to do an activity i have to think about it but no often we think about things beyond the activity that is to be done say if there's uncertainty about our job but that's what activity can we do okay i can work at it i can do my job responsibly i can build my profile but beyond that i can't do much about it but what happens we keep thinking about it keep thinking about it so if you consider the graph of time versus problems generally if we don't think about a problem at all the problem will hit us unawares and that's bad so we need to think about it so that we'll be more prepared for it so generally the more we think about a problem our preparedness increases so it's like the graph is linearly moving upwards but it doesn't linearly move upwards infinitely beyond a particular point it flattens so if you think about a problem we are able to deal with it better but if we keep thinking about the problem after some time it just flattens the more we think about it we don't come to any solutions and after that that graph goes down the more we think about the problem the more we feel overwhelmed like a fan when the fan moves round and round and round when the fan moves round and round it cools the environment but when our mind moves round and round and round it heats us up it heats us up so what we need to do is that when our mind is overthinking some issue 
How do we know we are overthinking? Last time when I had come, I gave the whole class on overthinking. But simply, when, our, when by thinking, we are not coming to any productive understanding. We can say that by this time, now it's overthinking. So, we all need a satisfying object of thought where we can direct our thoughts. If we don't have a satisfying object of thought, we will be thinking of unsatisfying things and we will be increasing our pain. So the pain is there at a physical level because of a problem. Say somebody has got a fracture. There is a pain. But somebody keeps thinking, why did I get this fracture? Why did I get this fracture? My friends are going out and enjoying. They are all active and I am suffering. Now that thinking will increase their pain. But if they have a satisfying object of thought, okay, I have got this fracture. I'll deal with it. If I need some rest, I'll take some rest. But let me hear about Krishna. Let me sing about Krishna. Let me direct my thoughts constructively towards something. We, if we have a satisfying object of thought, then that will offer us relief from the overthinking of the mind and the increase in the pain that comes from the overthinking. So in this way, actually we may say there are different satisfying objects of thought, but Krishna is the most satisfying object of thought. Why? Because Krishna is also purifying. When you think about Krishna, we also become purified. Our minds agitating forces within them, the impurities go down. And thus, when we think about Krishna, we can rise above the problems. So the problem of pain, the ultimate solution to it is, is becoming absorbed in Krishna. When we become absorbed in Krishna, to the extent we can deal with the problem, we will deal with it in a mood of service, in a mood of uh, contribution. But we, to the extent we can't deal with it, we'll absorb ourselves in Krishna and rise above the problem and tolerate it. If we learn to fix our mind on Krishna, then we may have to live with pain, but we won't have to live in pain. Pain may still be a part of our life, but pain won't consume our life. We may have to live with pain, but we won't have to live in pain. So the... That is the conclusion of the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna doesn't tell Arjun that this world is Dukkhalaya, this world is a place of distress, so stay distressed for the rest of your life. That is not the mood of the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, Arjun gives him the wisdom, the bhakti wisdom by which Arjun becomes pacified. Sitosmi gata sandeha, I become peaceful. So similarly, whatever be the pain in our life, if we learn to direct our consciousness towards higher spiritual reality, towards Krishna, we'll find that, that the pain will become manageable. We will be able to live with the pain and not only live with the pain, we will grow through, through the pain in our spiritual understanding and spiritual realization. So I will summarize. I spoke on the topic of the problem of pain. And I spoke three main parts. First was that materialistic explanations. At a functional level, people say that oh, pleasure and pain are just always together. Are they there in the world? And pain makes pleasure more enjoyable. But nobody lives like that. Nobody deliberately goes to embrace pain so that pleasure will become more enjoyable. So it's that, that is not an explanation, that is a rationalization. It is, uh, so then we talk about that's a, that's a functional materialism. At a level of, funda at a level of philosophical materialism, that if matter is all that exists, then pain doesn't exist at all. Because there is pain is not a physical reality. So there is no painometer which in medical science can measure pain as a conscious experience. So, at a material level, if you say that, oh, everything happens by chance, then some people are lucky, some people are unlucky. But that is not the way even materialists or atheists train their children. They train their children to be responsible, to do good things so that they will get good results. So, why, why is this pain there? At materialism, there is no explanation for that. Now, materialists may use this to refute religionists and theists. They say that, because bad things happen to good people, there is no God. But we could turn around and ask that why should bad things not happen to good people? Why should there be any correlation between cause and effect? Within materialism, if everything is happening by unguided natural forces, there is no reason for any kind of correlation. So, if somebody, if all announcements on this notice board are false, then even that announcement is false. So, materialism makes itself claim to point out illogic in religion. But materialism itself has no basis for logic because there is no need for any logical co co correlation in materialism. Then we look at religious explanations. Within that we look at the Abrahamic explanation that suffering is because of, pain is because of the original sin. Now it could be but then the problem is 
that why is there difference in pain? Our problem is not just with the presence of pain, but the difference. Why do some people suffer more? Why do some people suffer less? If all of us have got pain as a result of sin, which has come as a genetic defect within us, then why the difference? And then the, that sin is done by humans who can be redeemed. But then why is, why is there pain in the animal world? And animals also suffer terribly. And that's why we would, we would not mind our children going to a harvesting festival, but we won't let our children go to a slaughterhouse. So then we look at the dharmic explanation that every action we could would place it in bigger and bigger frameworks to try to understand it. If the power, if the light goes off, has somebody switched off the bulb? Has that bulb stopped working? Has the power supply gone off? Has the power plant been blown up? There could be different levels of explanations. So the principle of karma is action, reaction, correlation. And if somebody has got a bad throat, a sore throat, first look at the recent karma. Did you eat something bad? So inappropriate? If there is no explanation at the recent level, then we go further back at a remote level. And the understanding that there is a soul who goes through many lifetimes that expands the frame to be before this life and beyond this life. And then look at, so when somebody is suffering, we should never jump to the remote explanation when the recent explanation will work. So if there is an immediate explanation and an immediate solution, we we'll work at that level. So if a patient is having some suffering, the doctor look at the immediate cause and work at the immediate solution. But if this doesn't work, then it's reasonable to look at a bigger <coughs> picture. And <coughs> then I discuss ultimately that if this, this might be a reasonable explanation, but most important is the solution. So what is the solution for pain? We talk at, at one level, at an immediate level, our material needs are like analgesics. They are required and we need to put due attention to address them. But that is not enough. We also need the antiseptic. The antiseptic is, the Bhagavad Gita explains, pain points to an essential incompatibility. That we are spiritual beings who are joy seeking and the world is material and temporary filled with distress. So the ultimate solution to pain is to raise our consciousness from the material level to the spiritual level. And that is done through Bhakti Yoga or through the various practice, spiritual practices across different traditions. Now, Bhakti Yoga is like the antiseptic and material thing that we do is like the analgesic. So sometimes we may come to God only for the analgesic, but God may give us the antiseptic. It's like the, from the doctor's perspective, both doctor and patient's pur purpose is the same to free the patient from pain. But the patient is concerned more with the analgesic, doctor is concerned more with the antiseptic. So sometimes if we even pray to God and the pain doesn't go away, we shouldn't think that God doesn't care. Rather, there's something else going on. And then I concluded that sometimes for some situations, the analgesic may just not work. When there's uncertainty, insecurity, at that time, we have to, instead of just thinking more and more about the problem, making it worse, what we do is we think adequately so that we are prepared to deal with it. Then after that, we direct our object towards, direct our thinking towards the satisfying object of thought. And Bhakti Yoga connects us with Krishna, who is not only a satisfying object of thought, but is also a purifying object of thought. And the more we practice Bhakti Yoga, the more our mind will become attached to Krishna. Our thoughts will habitually move towards Krishna. And thus, even amidst distress, we by directing our, our thoughts towards Krishna, won't aggravate our pain. So we may have to live with pain, but we won't have to live in pain. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Is there any question? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody has a question?